Matthew 26, verse 45, it says, Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. When I kissed the man, pressed him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the man stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions and angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading the rebellion when you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all of the disciples deserted him. The flesh. And the Lord has blessed with this reading and hearing of his holy word. Let's just pray for a moment. Dear God, we pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Question for you today. Have you ever been betrayed? <laughs> ever been there? We all have, haven't we? Uh, it's just part of being human. It happens to everyone. It even happens to Jesus. You know, we see it happening in today's scripture lesson in a big way. I mean, everyone there betrayed Jesus. It's huge. You ever have a huge betrayal in your life like this? I did. Uh, uh, and when you get betrayals like this in your life, they, they have great impact on your life. I remember my senior year in college being betrayed uh, by some of my college friends. We'll call him Derek. That's not his real name. But uh, Derek, when I got to college, the campus my senior year, my friends were already buzzing about this guy named Derek. Uh, they had been there the previous week to help the new students with orientation, and Derek had transferred into our college from another school, and so they knew him, and they said he was great and wonderful, and he kind of was. He was a great guy, and he kind of became part of our circle of friends, and uh, to the point where he spent most of his time at our apartment. Uh, he would spend the evenings there, and then rather than heading back down to campus in the evenings, to go to his dorm room, he would just spend the night on the futon in our apartment. Uh, as the semester wore on, though, we started to see that there were cracks in, in Derek's personality. Uh, things weren't always the way he said they were. He wasn't always uh, portraying himself to be what he really was. We thought, okay, he's a nice guy. We'll be his friend. In December, one of my roommates graduated, and we had an opening in our apartment. And we said, well, Derek, well, why don't you move in with us? And when we, uh, me and my other roommates, we said a bunch of stuff, this would be good. We can keep an eye on him. Out of the trouble he seems to be getting into. Big mistake. Uh, he, uh, Derek was our roommate our second semester, and, and, and uh, the, the cracks in his character just came all, all out of uh, bursting forth dams of things that were happening. We would get word back about Derek uh, and, and some unsavory people he was hanging out with, and, and he would be uh, at different corners and shadows of campus uh, doing drugs, they would say. He's out drinking, and he's uh, uh, sneaking into girls' dorm rooms at night and spending the night there, which the Geneva College is a no no. And uh, it would just get bad. And we even heard, finally, it came to a point where he had borrowed some guy's car, borrowed, but likely had taken some guy's car and had been drinking and he crashed it and didn't really return to the guy until a few days later. And uh, one night I remember being wakened up uh, in, in my uh, apartment by shouting. I woke up and, and it was my roommate, Paul, and he was out in the other room shouting at Derek. Derek had been gone from the apartment for several days. And he had come back in the middle of the night and gotten to talk stuff. It was Stephen. So Todd was screaming at him, and, and Derek left. And uh, so the next day we told Derek, you, know, you, you have to find someplace else, but you cannot be here. And within a week, we got word from the dean's office that a report had been filed, uh, saying that my roommate had sexually assaulted Derek multiple times the previous semester. And it was ridiculous. It was all untrue. And, and, and Derek went uh, over time uh, convincing people on campus that this was true, and some people started to believe it. So there was that, that feeling of uh, just a really huge betrayal, mostly toward Todd, but uh, me and all my friends felt that it. it was directed at us. And that's huge, and that's hard to get past. And, and, but it, I was able to because I had all my friends around me. All my friends had to be me. They had to turn from me 
just this morning. We stuck it through, and we got through it. In today's scripture lesson, though, that's not what we see happening to Jesus. Because, like I said, in this scripture, everyone betrays Jesus. I mean, it's everyone there. Of course we know, first off, Judas betrays Jesus. He is the betrayer. And, and if you doubt it, just read John's gospel. Every time John mentions Judas, he, he tells him, oh, by the way, he's the traitor. He, he's the betrayer. He doesn't want you to forget that. Uh, he tells you every time, Judas is the betrayer. And, and John tells us some other things about Judas' character. He says he's a thief. He says Judas was the one who kept the money for Jesus and his followers. They were given money to help the poor. And rather than help the poor, Judas would sometimes help himself to it. And so you get this picture of Jesus' character. Uh, and you start to think, well, was he ever really following Jesus? Was he ever really listening to Jesus? Or was he just kind of with Jesus because he thought he could get something out of him? What was Jesus' character? But well, we know he was the betrayer. And, and so eventually... Things add up, and Judas, he goes to the, the, the spiritual leaders of the time, and he says, what will you give me to give you Jesus? What are you going to give me for it? And they tell him, well, you know, we need to get Jesus in a quiet place away from the crowds, so that the riot doesn't start when arrest him. Can you do that for us? We'll give you 30 silver pieces. And he says, yeah. And, and, and finally, the night arrives. Uh, Judas knows Jesus will probably be in Gethsemane, with just his uh, uh, disciples, the apostles, and not a whole lot of crowds. And he goes, and he gets a crowd, he gets the guards from the chief priests and, and the religious leaders, and he goes to betray them. He says, here it is, here's the plan. The one I kiss is the one. Arrest him. And then we, we, we get to Jesus in the garden. He says to his, his disciples, look, my prayer's coming. And he walks Judas. And he walks right up to Jesus. And he says, greetings, Rabbi. And he kisses him. He betrays him with a kiss. But Judas isn't the only one who betrays Jesus here. I mean, if they're all uh, manner of people betraying, the guards, the crowd, they come to, to this place with swords and clubs. They betray Jesus. You say, how? Well, Jesus tells them, I was out in public teaching every day. And you didn't come near me. You can arrest me at any time. You come here in the middle of the night to arrest me. That's betrayal. It's betrayal of the people who trust you and the people you represent because you're up to something underhanded. Because you could arrest me any time and you do it now. And he's betrayed by them. But they're not the only ones who betray Jesus here. Because we see, right before the scene cuts to uh, Jesus being on trial at the home of Caiaphas, we get one final statement that says, Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. These disciples, these friends of Jesus, who said, well, we'll be there with you for everything. They go. They betray Jesus. They betray their friendship. They just leave Jesus there alone. Everyone in Gethsemane on that night, in some manner, betrayed Jesus. And he's there alone by himself. But how does Jesus handle it? That, that's what we need to look at. Well, when Jesus is betrayed, he handles it in a way that's kind of different from us. It's unexpected. I mean, how do we handle betrayal? We get mad and bitter and angry. We don't friends, don't we? I found a story about a man who came home from work early one day and he found his wife in the kitchen with his best friend and they were smooching. And so, enraged by the betrayal, the man went and got a shotgun and killed the man. He killed his best friend. And his wife looked at him and she said, You know, if you're going to act like that, you're going to run out of friends. <laughs> Him was never born at all. 
So he knows Judas is wicked. He knows his ultimate uh, end, his eternal fate, and it's not a good one. But that doesn't stop Jesus from loving Judas. Judas comes betraying him, uh, and Jesus loves him. And we look at how Jesus treats his other betrayers. The guards who come with swords and clubs, Jesus protects them. You know, when his disciples see what's happening, uh, they're ready for a battle. They're ready to fight. And one of them, Luke tells us it's Peter, pulls out a sword. And he goes out and he cuts off the ear of a servant of the high priest. Ah, but Jesus, he, what's he do? He says, stop. It's like he's still teaching. He's saying, this is not how we are going to do things. And Jesus protects those who come against him. John even tells us that Jesus heals the ear of the servant whose ear got cut off. Jesus protects his betrayers. Now, and in calling Judas his friend and protecting his, uh, his betrayers in this way, Jesus is actually following his own teaching here. Remember, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, love your enemies. And when someone betrays you, they become your enemy real fast, don't they? He says, don't just love your friends, your neighbors, those you care for, but you've got to love your enemies. And Jesus does that here. He doesn't forget his teaching in this time when he's betrayed. He takes it as an opportunity to continue teaching, to show people, to show his disciples what it means to still love those people who come against you. Jesus, how does he handle the He accepts it. He accepts it so he can move on to what's next. He knows that something is coming after it. He accepts it. Uh, Jesus knew what was coming. He knew who would betray him, all the people who would betray him, and he knew how they would do it and when they would do it. And when it happens, he accepts it. And he goes forth calmly. There's no denial. There's no, I can't believe they did this to me. I can't believe they did this to me. I'm going to get them. No, he accepts it. And he goes forward. And finally, Jesus, when he is betrayed, he pursues peace. He refuses to lead that rebellion, that rebellion that Peter was ready for, no, and he says to his disciples, you know what, don't you know, I've been calling God right now, he will send 12 legions, thousands and thousands and thousands of angels, come and fight this battle for us, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this peacefully, because Jesus, he recognized that his whole mission is a mission of peace. Showing people, here, us, how to be at peace, bringing us into peace with God the Father. He's not going to up the ante, he, he's not going to rage, call people names. It's going to be about peace when he is betrayed. And that's how Jesus handles this betrayal. And we see it there. It's just amazing compared to how we would normally handle betrayal. And it's all well and good. Now, it's important for us to look at what our Lord and Savior Jesus went through, even before he got to the cross, uh, what he went through for us. But how does that impact us? What does it mean to us? Why are we learning about it? There's a lot that this says to us. Because let's face it, Jesus is not the only one in the history of the world to be betrayed. We, we've all been there, and we probably will have some sort of betrayal coming in our lives going forth from here. So when we're, when we're betrayed, we have a choice. We have a choice. We can do it our way, or we can do it Jesus' way. And we have a choice, you know, to do it our way, and, and you know, our way is getting angry and bitter and vengeful. And you know what? When someone betrays you, comes against you, you want to get revenge. Even if it's, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk to them at all. And then that'll get revenge on them because they betrayed me. Or, or you might actually go out and start doing things against them. That's our way of handling things. And, 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 and you know, it just ends in more misery for us, doesn't it? But that's how we do it, time after time after time. You know, it reminds me of the cartoon Daria. Did anyone here uh, ever remember the cartoon Daria? No one. All right, get it. Julie, you're from the right age. Uh, my parents got it for me on DVD for Christmas, so I've been watching it. And it was a cartoon from back in the 90s and the early 2000s. And it was about this girl in high school. Her name was Daria. And she was a misfit. Uh, she didn't fit in with any other groups. And, and she was thought. And she really didn't have very many friends. But she had one other friend whose name was Jane. And Jane was kind of a misfit too. So they survived high school. And they survived all these other cliques by just being friends together. And everything went along wonderfully until season four. When Jane got herself a boyfriend. And it was a happy relationship for a while. And so Jane and her boyfriend, they both realized, oh, they were going apart. It was probably just going to end. They both knew with them just being good friends. But while that was going on, Jane's boyfriend fell for Daria. And he kissed her. And Jane fell, found out that she didn't pray. And so she ended their friendship. And what was the result of that? 
Well, neither of them had any friends then. They were miserable. You know, we get a betrayal like that. We bring misery onto ourselves. So we can make that choice, make things worse for ourselves. But we can do what Jesus does. We can look at what he does. We can handle our betrayal that way. You know when we're betrayed, do we accept it? But we go on and on and on and think about it in our minds. You know, Jesus accepted betrayal so he can move forward. And that's what we need to do. Then we can look at what else Jesus did. Jesus loved those people who betrayed him. He called Judas friend. He, he made sure those uh, guards didn't uh, become injured. When someone betrays you, can you love them? Can you care for them? Maybe you'll never be friends again. But can, can you care for them? Can you, uh, can you still love them the way Jesus tells us to love? Because like I said, Jesus taught, love your enemies. And when they betray you, they become your enemy real fast. But the teaching on this doesn't stop with just Jesus. Paul takes what Jesus says, and he carries through with that even more in Romans chapter 12, where he starts quoting Proverbs 25, and he says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Why, your enemy? How come not why? Well, then Paul tells us from Proverbs, in doing this, you will heap burning coals in his head. And we think, yes! I'm going to go be nice to that guy who betrayed me, and he's going to get burning coals in his head. It's, it's revenge. It's not revenge. Now, the people in the culture, when it was originally written, knew it was an illusion. An illusion that meant that you would cause that person to think differently, to repent. And apply this here. When someone betrays you, you treat them kindly afterward. Maybe you cause them to see why you were hurt by what they did. That's your choice. You can kind of, and, and cause them to see what they did. And, and maybe they'll even see something about Jesus Christ in your life. And if it's someone who doesn't know Jesus, well, maybe they'll start to think a little bit more about Jesus. And you can do that. You can have that impact when you are betrayed. If you handle betrayal the way Jesus models for us here, by accepting it, by loving others, don't escalate it, by pursuing peace. And that's what Jesus did. But it's your choice. You can be angry. And you can be bitter and resentful and, and full of vengeance. And you can pay the cost of that in your life and what that brings on you. Or you can be like Jesus. You know, I wish I could sit here and tell you that when I was betrayed in college by Derek, uh, I handled it like Jesus did. And I wish I could say, because I did that at one point in the story, but I, I didn't. Uh, I, I, I was thankful. I hung on to it for years. And you know, when all that came down, it was probably about a month and a half left in our, our college careers. And, and so I saw Derek on campus. Geneva College, not a very big place to lose someone in. So I'd see Derek uh, across campus coming around the sidewalk, and I'd take another sidewalk. I'd go the other way. When we pass him in, in a hall in one of the academic buildings, and I'd just look the other way. I, 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 to this day, I haven't spoken another word to Derek. I don't know where he is. Um, but I wonder. You know, I, I wonder. Last I heard about Derek was uh, just a year after I graduated college, so it's been many years. And someone I know saw him, and, and they had heard that he was living with a drug dealer. Pursuing all, all, all manner of just uh, horrible lifestyle choices that were not good for him. That were just going to bring him destruction. And when I think about Derek, I sometimes think, if I had handled that betrayal the way Jesus had shown me, could I have made the difference? Which is really what I wanted to do to begin with. Could I have made the difference? Could I have shown uh, Derek what he had done? Could he have been on another path? I'll never know. But I, I urge you today, when you're betrayed, don't make the same um, mistake. When you're betrayed, follow Jesus' example. You, you know, like, look to just accept who betrayed. Love those people who betrayed you. Doesn't mean you're going to be their friends, but love them. And then pursue peace. That's what Jesus did. Let us pray.